Welcome to the playlist on neurodynamics and nerve tension. In this video, we're going to be introducing this concept known as adverse neurodynamics, and understanding this will be our foundation for understanding limb tension tests and also the treatment for nerve tension, which is called a nerve glide. And there are nerve glides for all the specific nerves, and we'll be looking at those throughout this playlist. Let's begin by looking at movements or actions of muscles and tendons. So we know that muscles are contractile tissues. Muscles have tendons and aponeuroses that attach on bones, and when the muscles contract, they pull on those bones to produce overall movement. And this contraction is really active tension provided by the muscles. Then we have this tension, which is really passive tension or stretch. So for example, when you do a hamstring stretch, you are actually trying to lengthen the muscle. And if you do these stretches over time, that muscle will increase in length and it leads to better flexibility, better movement, etc. Okay? And then we often forget about compression, which is a very useful inhibition technique. Suppose you have very tight quadriceps, and maybe even your rectus femoris is spasming. If you take your hand and firmly press on the muscle belly of rectus femoris, you can actually inhibit those muscle spasms. And yes, it might cause some pain just putting pressure on a muscle belly, but you're certainly not going to cause any long-lasting damage. You're not going to compress blood vessels. You're not going to interrupt the flow of nerve signals up and down the extremities, right? Now, if we compare these movements or actions of muscles and tendons to that of nerves, we see that nerves behave very differently. They have very different properties. Obviously, muscles are contractile, but nerves are non-contractile, so we don't even need to worry about that. If we go to the passive tension or stretch, yes, we can stretch muscles, right? You have tight calves. You stretch the calves, and over time, you gain more dorsiflexion range. You get better mobility. Nerves do not respond well to stretch. If you have a fully grown adult with fully grown limbs, those nerves are not growing in length at all. Technically, they could grow a negligible amount in length, but for our purposes, they do not grow in length. They are finite. And so if you try and stretch that nerve, or put it under tension, we would say, well then there's nerve tension or neural tension, and you would probably see things like numbness, tingling, burning, shooting pain. If that nerve had a motor component, you might eventually see weakness in the myotomal distribution. And as you might guess, neural tension is associated with limited range of motion and inflexibility. Pain, numbness, paresthesias, weakness, etc., etc. Nerves do not like stretch. They do not like tension. And you can't just lengthen them like you can muscles. What about compression? Well, we already said that muscles can respond well to compression under the right circumstances. If somebody has a muscle spasm and you compress the muscle belly, it can reduce the degree of the spasm or abolish it altogether. But just like nerves don't like tension, they also don't like compression. You often hear the term nerve entrapment. In nerve entrapment, there's some structure likely compressing that nerve. And if you compress the nerve, you get similar effects to what you see with neural tension. You get numbness. You get tingling burning, shooting pain, and those latter two are both types of paresthesias. If there's a motor component, you might see weakness, etc., etc. And then finally, nerves can glide, and nerve gliding is necessary for neurodynamic mobility. So more on nerve gliding. The nervous system is one continuous unit. So up in the skull, we have the brain. Descending from that down the jugular foramen, we have the spinal cord, which goes all the way down to about the levels of L1 and L2, where we get the cauda equina. And coming off of this in various regions, we have the cranial nerves and we have the spinal nerves. Those ultimately form peripheral nerves like the sciatic nerve, the median nerve, etc. So everything is one continuous unit. And this is evidenced by the fact that if you displace the nervous system in one part of the body, it causes displacement of the nervous system in other parts of the body. What does that mean? Movement of virtually any joint in any direction either puts tension on the nervous system or slack on the nervous system. So for example, cervical flexion, so bending the neck downward. 
This puts a small amount of tension on the sciatic nerve. Well, how could that be? You've got neck movement, and then the sciatic nerve is way down in the glutes and the leg, right? Well, when you do cervical flexion, that actually puts tension on the spinal cord. Well, if you follow the spinal cord all the way down, down to the little nerve roots coming out of the cauda equina, well, then those form the sciatic nerve. So if you're putting tension way up on the top of the spinal cord, you're putting tension on the whole spinal cord, you're putting tension on the cauda equina, and therefore the sciatic nerve. Okay? We also have various movements at different joints that either put slack or tension on the nerves. So these are nerves right here that are running down the posterior aspect of the lower leg. We could say these are the tibial nerves, right? Notice that dorsiflexion puts tension on these nerves. When the foot's in a neutral position, well, there's a neutral amount of tension. And then in a plantar flex position, it puts those nerves under slack. Now, as you move from a plantar flex position to a dorsiflex position, you increase tension on that nerve. But then as you go from a dorsiflex position to a plantar flex position, you actually put slack on that nerve. So if you imagine oscillating between plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, you're thinking slack, tension, slack, tension. And so that nerve is actually moving back and forth a little bit over the various regions of the body, even within the foot. It's moving back and forth as you go between dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. It's moving back and forth as you go between plantar flexion and dorsiflexion at the ankle. It's doing the same thing in the lower leg. It's doing the same thing in the knee, etc., etc. And so this movement back and forth at the various joints is called nerve glide. And if somebody has sufficient nerve glide, we would say they have good neurodynamic mobility. If somebody has poor nerve gliding, maybe because of some kind of entrapment, nerve tension, etc., we would say they have neurodynamic hypomobility, which can also be termed adverse neurodynamics. So normally, individuals with sufficient neurodynamic mobility should be able to tolerate movements like this right here in the slump test that put tension on the nervous system. There's actually four movements here that are putting tension. Ankle dorsiflexion, knee extension, and we've got thoracic hyperkyphosis, and cervical flexion. Somebody that can't tolerate this likely has some degree of adverse neurodynamics. They have poor nerve gliding in one or more areas. Maybe it's in the neck. Maybe it's the thoracic spine. Maybe it's the knee. Maybe it's the ankle. Maybe it's even in the hip somewhere. Okay, It's up to you to figure that out. But poor tolerance to these positions that put tension on the nervous system is likely a sign of adverse neurodynamics. Now, what do you do for adverse neurodynamics? What's the treatment? Well, the goal in general is to help the nerves move better. So you improve neurodynamic mobility. So you take somebody who has adverse neurodynamics, in other words, neurodynamic hypomobility, and you improve that mobility. And the exercises that you give are termed nerve glides or nerve gliding. And you might see other terms like nerve slides, nerve flossing. In fact, when you see glides, slides, flossing, or gliders, sliders, these are all terms for the same thing. Now, a word of warning, you may also see exercises known as nerve tensioners. I don't like nerve tensioners. Nerve gliders are way better. A nerve tensioner is a movement that actually attempts to stretch the nerves. I don't like them because why would you want to stretch the nerves? They don't increase in length. It causes pain and it doesn't really do any good. We want to get the neurodynamics of that nerve much better. So as you're moving between plantar flexion and dorsiflexion and so on and so forth, this nerve starts to move better over the ankle joint. It's moving better back and forth in the lower leg. It's gliding better or sliding better in all of these positions. And if we get them sliding better, or gliding better, flossing better, whatever you want to call it, we've improved that neurodynamic mobility we have reduced the nerve tension and potentially get rid of some of these things that we talked about up here, like numbness, paresthesias, including tingling and burning shooting pain, 
potentially weakness, limited range of motion. We can fix a lot of problems by understanding adverse neurodynamics and appropriately giving exercises like nerve glides. And as we go forward in this playlist, we're going to be discussing a lot of treatments like that, especially nerve glides. At the end of the playlist, we'll look at some special tests that are used in the assessment of adverse neurodynamics. So hopefully you enjoyed this. Stay tuned for more videos in this playlist. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.